All right, thank you, Charlie. I, I told you that you could uh, embellish the uh, the bio, and wow, you you really took me at my my suggestion there. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. So a story. Back in February of 2020, I was at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Scott. And I participated in the first, and only thus far, roving Central Illinois rug. For those of you that don't know, a rug is a Red Hat user group. I had sat down with people from different campuses, at UIUC, at ISU, Craig and I had talked about this for quite some time, and had planned this master plan of we were going to have this rug, and it was going to go from, from Urbana to Normal to Springfield, and it was going to be the Central Illinois rug. We had demand and interest, and it was going to be spectacular. Did you all look at the date? A week later, I started wearing a mask. About two weeks after that, Red Hat told me, you're not going anywhere. No one wants you anyway. We haven't done an in-person rug in central Illinois since. Another story. At Red Hat, I've covered both education and state and local government for some time. One of my customers at the time a unnamed state government, I have to keep these people safe and confidential, had a modernization project that they were going to kick off in July of 2020. It was a project that had a huge scale. Everybody across the entire IT landscape was going to be involved. They had set aside about $5 million, although I had been told by the CIO that he had a little bit more of a set aside because he knew that it was going to go over budget. See the date? <laughs> that project never started. That entire budget went to a panic-stricken, oh my god, we need remote technologies implemented as soon as possible. Then they spent the next two years struggling to modernize because they had not modernized systems in their planned modernization initiative. So what does that mean? What are the commonalities between these two things? Well, I'm going to say it's lack of attention. It's, it's the inability to deal with change. It's rigid scheduling. It's the lack of foresight. It's the lack of robustness. It's the idea of doing something in a big bang fashion. We're going to modernize all of our systems over the next three months. It's going to be great. And the culture that was in place was not one that had been prepared for or was willing to accept change, especially on the scale that the entire world has been expected to accept, accept change over the last two years. So like Charlie said, my name is Damian Eversman. I consider myself both a technologist and an educator. I have been both in front of students in the classroom as well as in front of IT professionals for several decades now. Um, I do have the fantastical title of Chief Architect for Education at Red Hat. And I'm here because education is a passion of mine. If you want to reach out to me, there's all of my digital social media, uh, digital nomad, I guess. Um, if you reach out to me, just let me know where you came from and how you've heard of me. So what is at the heart of the problem? Big Bang modernization initiatives. We're going to focus on, on that, not on my failed rug. That I'll deal with on my own time. So what is the problem with these Big Bang modernization initiatives? Well, let's talk about the attributes of these modernization initiatives. They're time boxed, right? We're going to start the project on this date, and our goal is to finish the project on this date. And these happen once every five years, knowing budget cycles in the public sector, probably more like once every 10 years. They're marked by huge budget allocations that often mean a 
taxation increase or tuition raise or something like that, some way to garner up a huge amount of capital to pay for it. And it's normally all hands on deck. Everybody across the entire enterprise needs to be involved in this process because it is such a huge undertaking. So what's the problem with that? Well, we spend three or four months modernizing and the day after the completion date, we're not modern anymore. We've started drifting away from modern. And for the next five or sadly 10 years, we drift away from modern, in some cases to the detriment of the entire enterprise. Large capital expenditures draw a ton of attention. Very often careers have ended when somebody requests large capital expenditures. And all hands on deck means everything else that you had going on is going to suffer. It's going to wait. It's going to sit around while you modernize. So let's talk about continuous modernization. Or maybe as I'm planning on relabeling it, just in time modernization. <laughs> the first and absolute most important thing that you need to do in order to implement continuous modernization is to foster a culture of change. Change is what it takes. That's what a big bang modernization effort is, change. Modernization in general is change. In fact, one could say any change for the better is a form of modernization. Continuous modernization is at the middle of everything. So we at Red Hat like to talk about the big trio of decisions, the people, the process, and the technologies, right? And this fits in a lot. This trio can be found in a lot of places. You know, we talked about the academic constituents, the, um, the people, and then about the technology in education over the coming decades. And it's the same thing. It's the people, the process, and the technology. And modernization is at the core of all of these. You can install new software, get new technology, but if you don't update processes to use it or train people to understand it, you haven't modernized. You've just put new bits on the hard drive. So one of the first things you need to do is get people willing to make the change. Now the naive would say, just tell them it's time to change and it'll happen. Studies have shown that static norms, i.e. dictums from above, don't get you anywhere. It's dynamic norms that make change. They did a study at a university where they wanted to start saving water. And so in the residence halls, in the laundry facilities, they posted information about saving water. This was in California. They tend to be drought ridden. In one residence hall, they put signs that said, please combine loads, save water. In another residence hall, they posted studies on water conservation. They talked about the problems of not having water. They talked about the farmers that were suffering. They talked about Southern California that was drying up because Northern California was sucking all the water down. They discovered that in the residence hall where they put the information about change, change happened. Change happened at a rate 50 to 75% faster than where they just said save water. So in order to make change the norm, we have to educate people on why we're doing the change. We have to show them how the change is gonna benefit them, how it's gonna benefit their friends, their families, and how it's gonna benefit society. Next thing is, resilience is not the ultimate goal. In IT, we often talk about resilience. Resilience is one of the most important things that we talk about. But if you actually look at the definition of resilience, the definition is the ability to recover after a stress. I propose the term we should be using is robustness. Robustness is capability of performing without failure under duress. The difference here is 
small, but it's kind of important. A resilient plant is one that after its branches are broken, grows them back. A robust plant is one that during the storm flexes and bends and retains the branches that it has. After the storm, the robust plant returns immediately to doing what it was before the storm. The resilient one needs to take a time out. Adopting a culture of change has a lot of side effects, but one of the biggest ones is preparedness. If I get my entire IT organization to be prepared for change to happen, we're constantly tweaking and changing and installing and updating, and this is just day-to-day -day operations, and they're used to change, then when I throw an unexpected change at them, or the world throws an unexpected change at them, it's just another change. We do this all the time. We change things up, and we can handle this one too. So whether it's a change in plan because the stakeholder decided they wanted different features in the software and we're going to roll with those punches, or a pseudo-catastrophic clim uh, uh, pandemic curveball, we can handle everything because we are used to change. One of the most important things to do and adopt as a culture of change is objectivity over subjectivity. So what does that mean? Well, we need to approach our IT landscape as if we're looking at it through the lens of a camera. It's just a picture. Tomorrow the picture might be the same. Tomorrow the picture might be different. We change the picture based on what we need. Some people might call this the pets versus cattle conundrum, for those of you that know what I'm talking about. Cattle are expendable. For those of you that might be vegetarians, I'm sorry for the reference. It is just an analogy. Cattle are expendable. We can replace one cow with the next. Pets, on the other hand, are members of our family. We feed and care for them and cuddle with them, and they share our, our couches and our beds sometimes. We don't want our servers to be pets. We want them to be cattle. If the server goes down, we just want to spin up another one. If the service ceases to function, it'd be nice if something automatically came up and just replaced it. I'm sure every single one of you has that box in the corner that nobody remembers what it does, but we're afraid to shut it down for fear of who's, who might be on the other end of the phone call that comes when it shuts down. That's a pet, and it's a pet we probably don't want anymore. Finally, your provost talked a little bit about the disruption that we've been experiencing. Disruptors have been a big thing for the last decade, right? Whether it's uh, ride sharing or video streaming services or Airbnb or whatever it is, disruption is really a harbinger of change, right? Like he said, a couple decades ago, nobody had a cell phone. Now we can't live without them. I'm sure the first cell phone probably had people calling it a disruptor or something of that sort. Disruption is just a harbinger of change. And if we've adopted a culture of change, then disruptors are just another step in the day. It's another thing that we can move on and embrace. One of the things I'd like to point out on the slides as I go is, um, that some of these points are about attracting and retaining talent. Some of these points are about accepting non-traditional talent into our organizations. We've talked about workforce development for a little bit. We've talked about right, the, the communities down the road, people that are maybe not as privileged as the rest of us. These people are still talent. Non-traditional talent maybe, but they're still talent and they have a lot to offer. So embracing disruption is a great way to attract and retain good talent. One of the things that I always say when dealing with the public sector is, there are two ways you can attract and retain good talent. Number one, pay them a shit ton of money. Number two, give them something cool to do. 
And in the public sector, we can't do number one. So if you want to attract and retain good talent, give them something cool to do. So I hate to say it to you, AppDev got here first. I realize that the majority of you are more of infrastructure kind of people. The majority of you in this room probably deal with AppDev in a frustrating way on occasion. AppDev got here first. They call it continuous integration and continuous deployment, CICD. The concept behind CICD is very simple. When I'm developing an application, the code that is in the repository should always be deployable. There should never be a point where I have broken it beyond usability. Continuous delivery is a software development discipline where you build software in such a way that the software can be released to production at any time. Now, that doesn't mean you want run off to a developer who's in the middle of a code branch and say, we're deploying your code. But what that means is you keep working code that is moving forward in an incremental way available at all times. The parent to CICD is Agile. Believe it or not, Agile has been around for over 20 years. The Agile Manifesto was written in 2001. And it actually had precursors before it. Things like extreme programming, rapid application development, unified modeling, test-driven development, feature-driven development. I can go on. Most of the people that were the, the founders of those movements actually got together to write the Agile Manifesto. The Agile Manifesto has 12 points that it makes. I've tried to sum them down a little bit here to four. The four points are simply this. Software development is iterative and incremental. We do not do waterfall. We do not do big bang. For those of you that aren't familiar with those terms because you haven't been in software development, waterfall is this concept of we research and figure out everything that we want the application to have up front. We do all of the plan and design and get all of that out of the way at the beginning. And then we spend the next several weeks months or years implementing that design. One of the biggest drawbacks of that is you sit with their stakeholder at the beginning and figure out all of the stuff that they want, and then you go away and hide in a closet for two years and build it. And when you get back and you show it to the stakeholder, they say, what the heck is that? That's not what I planned on. That's not what I described. The iterative process seeks feedback at every step. The feedback at every step is part of the efficient communication mechanism. That's point number two here. Now, the Agile Manifesto was written in 2001. They expected co-location and face-to-face communication. Obviously, we've moved forward in the last 21 years, and they are more accepting of non-co-location, but they are still adamant about face-to-face -face communication. Do not communicate with your teams via email. Communicate with your teams via Zoom or drop in on them. The idea behind this is there's so much more to be had in face-to-face -face communication than an email that is subject to interpretation. The other part of that face-to-face -face communication is it includes the stakeholder. At every step of the way, the stakeholder, the application owner, the person who has come to you and said, I want you to build this application has to be involved. Short feedback loops are of utmost importance. Agile calls them stand-ups, daily stand-ups. The teams get together every single day and talk, not for hours on end, for 10 or 15 minutes. Every person, every member of the team gives a status update, a very brief status update, and then enumerates any blockers that they have, anything that's keeping them from getting on to the next task they have. You don't work out the blockers there, you enumerate them. After the meeting, the people who have blockers then work them out in the way they need to be worked out. There is a facilitator. Scrum calls it a scrum master. And then finally, they focus on quality over quantity. Gone are the days of paying people by lines of code. We don't do that anymore. We did that back in the COBOL days. But that's not the way it works anymore. And there are plenty of tools 
that have been built over the last two decades to help enforce quality. If we go up one more level, we reach the culture. And the culture is DevOps. This DevOps culture encompasses Agile and encompasses CICD. And it can be defined by five principles. And they spell out columns. At the base of everything is culture. We've been talking about this all along. If everyone isn't bought in, if everyone isn't part of the culture, then nothing else is going to work. It's a bad foundation, and none of the other things will work. The next step is automation. If you're going to do something like deploy your application every single week, you don't do it by hand. You need to automate the process. And that's not the only process you automate. You need to automate all of these repetitive processes. Because the last thing an iterative approach needs to do is make somebody work harder. Lean IT. This doesn't mean we need to fire everybody but the fewest people that we need. This means that we need to separate all of the fat that happens between all of the different work uh, silos. right? So we're talking about IT here. I'm sure you're all familiar with silos. right? We have the hosting or virtualization team. We have the OS team. We have the security team. We have the app team. We have the network team. We have the storage team. We have all of these teams. And what happens is we have an hour worth of processing that needs to happen. But because it stretches out across all of these teams, it takes a week because we're handing things off between teams. Lean IT is about shortening that handoff, streamlining that handoff, and making sure that when we go from provisioning a machine to securing a machine to adding a network or a storage device or that sort of thing, that it happens without all of these pauses along the way. And automation kind of helps with that. Measurement, probably one of the least paid attention to but most important things. When we, talking, when we talk about change constantly, one of the most important things we need to do is make sure that the changes are good. We need to make sure that the changes are improving things. And so we actually have to measure things as we go so that we can compare a week from now what happened when we made these changes. Measurement is the feedback loop of DevOps. And it's the only way that you know you're going down the right path. And then finally, sharing. And this kind of fits back into the lean IT a little bit. This fits into the culture a little bit. But the idea behind sharing is, in all of these silos and all of these teams, you're likely to come up with a good idea. It'd be nice if they could leverage that good idea. So we need to make sure that we share all of the new processes that we find as we constantly change. So this brings me to open source. Open source is one of the biggest proponents of Agile, one of the biggest proponents of DevOps, and it happens to be Red Hat's home field advantage. Red Hat has been an open source company for its entire lifetime. We were founded in 1993. Linux was created in 1990, so we kind of hit the ground running. And during that entire time, we have been what we like to call an open organization. We took open source to the extreme, and we open sourced our decision process within our company. We open sourced our design, engineering, hell, we open sourced our new logo when we came up with our new logo, which goes to prove that not everything that comes out of open source is good. One of the tenets of open source is this idea of, and I'm going to say the word, and then I'm going to back off of it, meritocracy. Meritocracy at its core is a wonderful thing. It's the idea that anyone can have a good idea, and we're willing to listen to any good idea. The open source communities have backed off from it a little bit recently because there is the contention that in the open source communities, only privileged people have the spare cycles and time to actually write code. And so therefore, only privileged people are coming up with the good ideas. And so the open source community is working very hard to encourage diversity. And at Red Hat, we also are working very hard to encourage diversity. But we still believe within our organization 
that meritocracy is probably one of our strongest assets. Open, by the way, is another way to attract and retain good talent. Open, by the way, is also a really good way to enable and foster non-traditional talent. Finally, inherent in DevOps is comfort with ambiguity. I'm sorry, Charlie. This is kind of an important one, but this is probably the CIO's biggest nightmare. When is that going to finish? Not entirely sure. We think in about four or five sprints. We'll see. A sprint is normally between one and four weeks. And a team going through a sprint is normally between eight and 15 or so people. They call it the two pizza box rule. If you can't feed the team on two pizzas, it's too big. That team needs to be willing to work through the sprint without concern for the backlog that has not been scheduled yet. It's the only way that they can be agile. It's the only way that they can get through things. We have a list of things that we're going to work on. We've picked these 15 off the top, and that's what we're doing this sprint. Number 16, it just has to wait until the next meeting. All right, so I talked about DevOps. I talked about how AppDev did it first. But I mean, how can we apply this to everybody? How can this apply to some of the things that maybe don't involve application development? Well, one of the biggest lessons that we've learned is that you want to shift right on the reactive to proactive spectrum, right? Reactivity means something happened, and now I'm going to go fix it. Proactivity means I thought ahead, and I have an option in, in place already. This is sort of the just-in-time modernization that your provost talked about. One of the benefits that also comes out of this for the CISOs that are in the house is security by default can actually be a thing. We don't bolt security on at the end. It actually becomes part of the process. Some of the biggest minds in DevOps, the authors of the book Accelerate that you see here, did a whole bunch of studies about security and how it fits in. And what they discovered is High-performing teams, agile teams, were more likely to incorporate security into their delivery process. They actually involved the InfoSec people at every step of the way. They listened to what they had to say. They incorporated their suggestions. And most of all, they did it in a way that actually did not slow down the development process it's actually slower to bolt security on at the end than it is to incorporate it in the entire process. Because bolting it on at the end means rewriting and refactoring code that you thought was done. Agility and innovation. This is a different agile. I know in IT we like to overload words. Agility and innovation is one of the biggest things that's fostered by this, this culture of change, this culture of modernization. One of the biggest benefits of making change the norm is that people are actually willing to suggest changes. If someone has an idea that might shake things up a little bit, but has a good chance of making a big bang, well, if you're willing to accept change at any step of the way, they're willing to actually offer that suggestion up to you help you figure it out, implement it. When we look at companies like Twitter and Facebook and Apple and all of the big disruptors that we've had over the last couple of decades, many of the ideas that they've implemented that have become some of their biggest features are ideas that came from a developer in the trenches who said, you know what? We could do it this way and it'd be really cool. If you foster a culture of change, if you're continuously modernizing and changing, your people are going to want to offer their, their changes. And being known as an innovator 
is an awesome way to attract and retain good talent. Finally, unlinking from the status quo. The, the first sentence on there is actually a quote from a friend of mine. I can't take credit for that. But the calling card of the status quo is technical debt. If we're willing to settle in and rest on our laurels, we start accruing technical debt almost immediately. So what do we need to do? We need to break away from the pack. We need to not be willing to settle for the status quo. We need to move forward and modernize every single day. The status quo doesn't keep good employees. And non-traditional talent is often not accepted by the status quo. So these are two more opportunities to change people's lives. So how do I get started? I've done all of these theoretical discussion. How do I get started? Well, I'm going to give you three suggestions. These are not the be all and end all. These are just the way to get started. Standard operating environment. Anybody familiar with that term? The concept is simple. Instead of having dozens and dozens and dozens of tools that all do essentially the same thing scattered throughout our environment, we figure out which one does it maybe just a little bit closer, better than the rest, and we settle on that tool. There's 10 steps to building a standard operating environment. They're all pretty simple and straightforward. Simplify to improve efficiency and productivity. If I pick a tool that works for everything, then I only need to train people on one tool. And if they want to move from one department to another department, that knowledge will transfer with them. Document continuously. If you're lucky, you've picked a technology that enables you to self-document. Balance standardization with flexibility. This is sort of like the flip side to that first coin. We can't always pick one tool. Maybe we need to pick two. Automate your infrastructure. The last thing that you need to do every Monday morning is open up the queue and provision another 200 machines. Embrace new technology as appropriate. Notice there's a phrase after technology. Embrace new technology as appropriate. Don't do it just because. But do it if you can, if it makes sense. Contain configuration drift. This actually goes well with automate your infrastructure. If you do it right, you get two for one there. Concentrate on services, not servers. Charlie asked me yesterday at dinner about the Death struggle, was that what you called it? The death struggle between Linux and Windows. What direction do we see it going? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. I would love to see more Linux. But in the end, you guys don't care about the operating system. You care about the services. Your constituents don't care if your LMS is running on Linux, Windows, AIX, or PDP-8s. Well, they might care about the PDP-8s because it would be crap. All they want is the LMS to be working. You care about services, not servers. And that's really what you should be focusing on. Scale dynamically to meet challenging demands. This doesn't mean have scale available in case there is a challenging demand. This goes back to just in time. You need to have a way to scale dynamically. You need to have a way to grow with the need and shrink with the lack of need. Lord knows your budgets are tight enough as it is. Be ready for failures. Failure is the best teacher. Failure is the best way to learn. You are going to get more information from a failure than you are from a success. A success just says what you did was right. A failure gives you tons of information about what you didn't do right. 
And finally, boost security with a layered approach. This goes back to what we talked about before, right? When you involve security at every step of the game, security is automatically built in. It's automatically multi-layered, and it's the way to make sure that you are the least likely to be the next ransomware headline. Like Charlie said, I have to feed my family, so I'm going to show a few product slides as I go through these steps. First one is Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Most of you are probably familiar with it. Red Hat Enterprise Linux, in my opinion, makes a very good standard operating environment. It gives you a lot of flexibility for the ways to deploy things. And obviously, if you're caring about services, not servers, it doesn't really matter that much. But you got to have something. Why not RHEL? Automation. You need to automate in order to get into this continuous modernization world. This is not just give all of your constituents automation tools. You need tools that work across all of the silos. Problem solved with automation? Manual processes. You give a computer a job and tell it to do it 100 times, and it will do that job exactly the same 100 times. You give a human a job and tell them to do it 100 times, they'll screw it up on about the third one. We get distracted. We get bored. Our brains weren't built for repetitive tasks. Our brains were built to learn and grow. You don't learn and grow by provisioning a Linux box 400 times. Let automation do that. Automation helps you deal with standards and governance and security. And it helps make sure that it stays in place across all of these disparate teams as you move from silo to silo to silo. And we've all dealt with the reduction in IT budget. Every single person in your organization is overworked. And you all know it. And automation actually helps smooth that out a little bit. It helps enable those people that are beleaguered by doing drudgery and toil every day. It helps enable them to actually come up with those ideas that if you've instilled a culture of change, they are going to offer you. Red Hat offers Ansible Automation Platform. This tool is self-documenting. It's written in plain English text, so it solves that documenting as you go along thing. And it works across silos. There are multiple tools that are built into it to actually enable your teams to take automation that is written for provisioning a machine and automation that is made for provisioning a network connection for that machine by a different group, by experts in those groups, and chain them together. And not only that, it can connect it to ServiceNow and make sure that when someone requests a VM, once they have the right approvals, all of those jobs are kicked off. We can automate for velocity. The idea behind automating for velocity is to make deployments faster, to make recovery faster, to move faster. Automate for collaboration. If you and I can automate a process together, and your knowledge takes one piece and my knowledge handles the other, then we've just bridged a boundary. And we automate for growth. You've been asked to do more with less. This is the more part. Finally, modularity. Containerize all the things. This goes back to caring more about services than about servers. This enables you to do a number of things like improve customer experience, increase reliability, reduce costs. This is better data center density at its base. I can put more applications on fewer hardware. I can deploy more applications to more clouds seamlessly. Containerization comes along with the security benefit of every application is sandboxed. So if one application fails, the rest of the applications that live next to it don't. And it enables you to iterate fast. Containerization is actually one of the biggest tools used by the DevOps world. 
It helps you to partition your services into smaller and smaller services, into microservices, to enable your teams to build bigger and better applications faster and to reuse tools that they know work in new and interesting ways. And of course, Red Hat has a tool for that, OpenShift Container Platform. You may have heard of Kubernetes. This is our distribution of Kubernetes, if you will. We simply take Kubernetes, put it on a strong platform of, Open, or of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and we build in a whole lot of integrations with application development platforms on top of it. Makes it easy for operations to manage, and it makes it really easy for developers to develop. And one of the nice things that the operations people like is it gives you a really good boundary where you can say, this is where your powers stop and mine start. So if there are any developers in the room, I'm sorry, it puts guardrails on the developers. If you are a developer in the room, it is relatively freeing and enabling, though, to be able to spin up a new application and deploy it to a container platform without having to send a single request to IT. Continuous modernization is not a single Big Bang approach. It is the antithesis of Big Bang. It's not something that you are going to implement tomorrow. It's something that you are going to implement over the next lifetime. It's a goal to strive for, it's a goal to reach, but it's one that you don't reach unless you get started. The best way to start, just start your list of all of the items that need modernized, and instead of putting them all into a huge budget and saying this is our modernization initiative, start with one of them tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>